Bruce is Ray McGovern, native of New York and Washington. In the early 60s, uh, he was an Army Infantry Intelligence Officer in Vietnam. He served as a CIA analyst for the administration of John F. Kennedy to that of George H.W. Bush. Ray briefed one-on-one uh, -on -one President Ronald Reagan, most senior national security advisors from 81 to 85. He was his favorite briefer. Fluent in Russian, German, and Spanish. Ray holds an MA in Russian from Fordham University, a certificate of theology studies from Georgetown. He's also a graduate of Harvard Business School's Advanced Management Program. He also holds a certificate in theology and studies from Georgetown University, raymcgovern.com. And he also founded a uh, veteran intelligence agency group uh, for sanity, as he calls it. And he famously uh, would confront Rumsfeld lying about how they found WMDs in Iraq when he was running open psyops unchallenged on CNN and Fox News. Now, I wanted to get him on about Syria, IS, Iraq, the breakup of that country, uh, his take on what's really happening. I wanted to get into the police state, the MRAPs being put in place. But I want to first throw a curveball at uh, Ray. Snowden says there's a holy SH, you know what, T smoking gun revelation coming. Whistleblower says government believes he has information that would be the death of them all politically, close quote. Now, I have a lot of NSA whistleblowers over the years that we've had on the show. We've had William Benny on. We've had Seabell Edmonds on. We've had Wayne Madsen on. We've had just so many others have leaked me information. I mean, I got Snowden-type stuff when I was first on air in the mid-'90s. Had no idea how big it was with telecom whistleblowers about big hubs listening to everything and keyword and echelon. Then I had James Bamford on. But I know Ray knows about a lot of this, and, and we don't know what this particularly is, but I have a good idea about a whole trove of things that could bring down the political system, and what would they do to distract from that? So I want to just hit the waterfront with Ray, because I know he can go into each issue and really give us a briefing on each item. But if he had you know 10 minutes, which I'm going to give him the floor here and try to shut up, to give people a global briefing on the state of the world, I want him to give us his, uh, well, very accurate analysis, but also he's a very moral person. And, you know, knowing him now for about 10 years, uh, putting him in one of my films, uh, he, 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 he doesn't mince words and I think really gives us his real take on things without putting it through an establishment filter or darkly. Uh, and so I want to get his big picture take and then hone in on what he thinks is most important. But first off, what do you think the new Snowden info could be, Ray? Well, uh, Alex, good to be back with you. Uh, that is a curveball. Uh, could you give me a minute to get my catcher's mitt? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I'd only be speculating. Uh, but I imagine, given what Glenn, Glenn Greenwald has uh, hinted at in the past, that there are names and there are numbers and there are incredibly heinous snooping activities going on against very important people. Uh, I'll let you guess who they are, but they couldn't be more important in our country. And once that's revealed, uh, one would expect uh, that uh, substance you mentioned to hit the fan. But you know, the way things are working, Alex, uh, with the executive and the Congress and parts of our judicial system all kind of complicit in these crimes against our Constitution, you know, I'd have to say I'd be, have to be from Missouri as to whether anything would be done about this. Even the press, of course, the mainstream press, I'm not talking about you and others on the Internet, uh, the mainstream press is uh, complicit in this. So, yes, uh, I'm sure there'll be more shocking revelations. I expect uh, my name and yours to show up on one of these lists sometime soon. But whether or not this will have any impact, I mean, if, well, we'll just have to see. That's my best guess. How big are the overall revelations so far from Snowden and others? How much is that affecting the power structure? Or is it almost allowing them to come out of the closet caught lying about illegal political spying? And then if they don't get in trouble or if they don't get reversed, it almost sets the precedent. That's the problem. Once Obama decided that he'd only look forward and he wouldn't look back, you know, 
Uh, that's the abnegation of his responsibility to see to it that the laws of the land are faithfully discharged. That's a constitutional embarrassment. And so not only with the torturers, but with, we'll take uh, James Clapper, the National Intelligence Director, uh, who sits over 16, count them, 16 intelligence agencies in our government. He was asked on the 12th of March last year uh, by a senator, Senator Ron Wyden, uh, does the NSA collect any data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? Clapper, no, sir. Uh, not wittingly. Now, two months later, uh, he gave a letter to the head of that committee saying, oh, what I said was, quote, clearly erroneous, end quote. Sorry about that. Now, he was under oath. <laughs> he's, he's the head of the director of national intelligence. He lied under oath. He uh, told uh, Andrea Mitchell, well, I, I said the, the, the least untruthful thing. Well, what, what, is it, what will you come to here when, when the head of intelligence lies and then there are no consequences? So I'm afraid your, your point is right, that as long as we have people covering up for one another, um, John Brennan included, of course, with this famous torture memo, uh, memo that the Senate Intelligence Committee has completed, uh, as long as you have no accountability, and as long as nobody in Congress except Ron Wyden and Udall from, uh, from Colorado, or nobody has any guts, it's very different, very different, Alex, from the situation in the mid-'70s when Frank Church from Idaho and a couple other people Edsky in the in the House stood up and said, you know, the CIA, NSA, Army intelligence abuses are just gone too far. We're going to have a real investigation. Now, as a sort of a corollary to this, guess what the first thing Frank Church found out? He found out that J. Edgar Hoover was wiretapping all his phones. <laughs> of course. I mean, so, so we put an end to J. Edgar Hoover's wiretap. That's actually J. Edgar Hoover went away, which was sort of a miracle. And we instituted some laws, including the FISA Act of 1978, which expressly pro prohibited the kinds of infringements on our Fourth Amendment rights that had been entered into before. And now we see uh, on steroids. So it's a situation where we have to get out in the streets, where we citizens have to put our bodies into the machine or else it's never going to stop. Ray McGovern, you've lived a lot of years and seen a lot, not just in the White House, but Vietnam, you name it, describing the slow evolution of America, getting better in some ways, but worse in others. I didn't live through a lot of that. I'm 40, but I've studied it. And I've got to say, America overall is degenerating into a kleptocratic, weird, corporate, fascist, uh, bizarro world and seems to be rotting now, seems to be uh, just, just malaise is setting in. And it's not even like a hyper tyranny where the Nazis are rounding up all their enemies. Uh, of course, they're killing a lot of innocents overseas. They're mainly just doing it all out in the open, flaunting it in a grotesque display uh, of uh, above-the-law behavior. I mean, how would you describe what we are today? Well, I would say that we're an extra-constitutional society right now. Uh, and the thing that uh, bothers me most, Alex, is something that, you know, when you're 51 years in this town of Washington, you see a lot of change. Well, there's one change that dwarfs all the other changes, and that is that we no longer have in any real sense a free media, and that is big. Look at how the media has distorted A, B, C, and D. Look how it's, it's uh, distorting the coverage on Gaza, on Ukraine. Any big-time conflict, the media will distort it. What's the result of that? Well. Most Americans don't have a clue as to what's going on. And that's really, really, really dangerous. Jefferson, Madison, many people pointed out that without a free press, uh, there can be no democracy. And so that's the main bugaboo here. And that's why your job and my job, to the degree we're trying to spread some truth around, is so terribly important. 
Now, that's the bad news. The good news is this, that whereas the fourth, the fourth estate did, okay? The fourth estate, some of your listeners probably remember that that expression was coined by um, Edmund Burke, a, uh, an English uh, member of parliament back in the late 18th century. Now, uh, he stood in parliament. At that time, there were three houses, two in commons, one in lords. And he said, uh, you know, I'm very proud to be part of this first estate. That's what they called it there, the first estate house of commons. But more important than I and all the rest of you uh, MPs are the people in the fourth estate. He looked at the balcony, and of course, they were all men in those days, but he was looking at the press, the, the pulp press. He said, you are more important than all of us because you hold us accountable. Without you, we can't be a democracy. Now, that's the fourth estate, and it's dead. Now, good news, there's a fifth estate. I'm looking at it here. I'm on Skype. You're, you're doing it here. There are all kinds of ways to reach people, especially the people who are going to live a, long, a lot longer than I am and longer than you are too, Alex. That's the good news. They won't put up with this stuff. They don't even read the newspapers, and I can't blame them. What they get is a steady diet of things on the web. So we have to make sure that they write diet of things on the web, and I think it's an uphill struggle, but we can't give up. There's no option to give up. Uh, people were t talking to me yesterday on Al Jazeera. Uh, boycott, disvestment, you know, sanctions. Uh, I think they'll be effective. I think it be effective, effective. And I said, you know, you're asking the wrong question. We're not, we're not called to be effective all the time. We're, we're called to be faithful. We're called to be do, doing the good because it's good. And we may not immediately achieve our objectives, we probably won't. But we're sowing seeds and we're showing the younger generation that we have something special here and we're willing to suffer That's for key. You do the right thing and fight back against tyranny because it's in your bones and in your gut and in your family line and in civilization. Not because, oh, I can win if I'm good and then sometimes I lie or sometimes I'm corrupt. That's Machiavellian bull. And I think it's that Machiavellian mindset that was always there, but it's really permeated not just the government and the corporations, but some of the public. A lot of the public's waking up and becoming more moral, getting back to what really matters. But for the others that aren't, I think it's a, 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 a decadence in society. And with that, we know, comes depression, comes war. What's your larger perspective, Ray McGovern, former top CIA briefer and analyst to Ronald Reagan and George Herbert Walker Bush, what is, and we really appreciate your time, sir, because I know you're a busy man. What is your larger worldview right now on the state of things with IS and Ukraine and the fighting getting really bad? And I want to bomb IS because they're horrible, you know, cavemen murdering Christians, m Muslim minorities, but at the same time, that's a new way to get back in Iraq, which we wrecked to begin with. It's so complex. Yeah, the the Iraq thing is a catastrophe, and we're responsible for it. Uh, there's no way that we can support the equivalent of the Islamic State in Syria and then fight against it in, in Iraq. I mean, <laughs> hello, who's running our foreign policy? A bunch of sophomores. Now... The, there's a scale that supersedes what I've just been talking about, and that has to do with a real danger to our national security, and that is Russia once again. Uh, we used to think that uh, Russia was sort of tamed, uh, that we could provoke it, uh, we could prick the uh, Russian bear, uh, poke it to, to uh, fare thee well. Well, that's not the case anymore. And uh, I've, I've just written an article. Uh, actually, it's a... Uh, it's a celebration of sorts uh, on the ending of the Berlin Wall. After 28 years, the Berlin Wall was built exactly 53 years ago today. They started to build it. Now, what's, what's my point on all that? Well, that, those were the days when the, the Russians felt threatened and we felt threatened. Uh, it, those were the days of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Checkpoint Charlie face-off with the tanks, Soviet and American. Those were the, uh, the times when there was a real Cold War and there was a real danger 
if statesmen like John Kennedy weren't around, that things would get out of hand and would blow each other up and the planet with us, okay? Now, that was quiescent until now. What's, what's happened now? Well, what happened now is that after the Berlin Wall, Wall fell, and that was November of 1989, there was an incredible chance for peace, Alex. You know, I sound, maybe this sounds weird, especially for the younger generation, but there were enlightened leaders, Karabachev and Shevardnadze, the foreign minister in Russia. They were willing to deal, okay? And they did deal. What happened was George H.W. Bush called up Karabachev, you know, and he said, you know, I'm really sorry about all your troubles, Mikhail, and I'm not going to take advantage of them. Let's get together. Let's not waste any time. I suggest we get together in Malta in three weeks. What do you say? Okay. And they did. Okay. November 9th, the wall falls. December 2nd, they're in Malta. They had a summit and they decided, okay, uh, we, the United States, would not take advantage of, of uh, as Bush said, I'm not going to dance on the Berlin Wall. Well, you know, that was very much to his credit. But then he said, but we're going to require some things of you, Mr. Gorbachev. At the time, there were 24 Soviet highly mechanized divisions in East Germany. 24. <laughs> you know, that, that translates to about 250,000 men, okay? Now, what Bush said was this. Look, we don't want you to do what you did in Hungary in 56, or what you did in Czechoslovakia in 68. We don't want you to do that now as East Germany and the rest of your satellites are falling apart. In return for that, we will honor my obligation not to move NATO one inch farther eastward toward Russia. Now, we expect you to allow East Germany to become part of a greater reunited... Stay there. Come back and finish it. And now the deal's been broken. I know you're going to get to that part. But for folks that don't know, we've broken an official deal with Russia and are moving weapons up against their borders. Not that Russia's great or wonderful, in my view, like, like Ron Paul said, Putin's no angel. We're not lionizing him, but the West, George Soros, all of them, are starting this. And so under common law and common sense, we're the bad guys. We are back live, ladies and gentlemen. I'll do a bit of overdrive to take more of your phone calls for JB and others that are holding. Ray McGovern leaves us in about six minutes. Former top CA analyst, and he's here giving us the basic breakdown from his perspective, which I agree with on the history of what has happened so far. So you were getting right up to the break with your point that this deal was made, for those that just joined us, with the fall of the Berlin Wall three weeks after, between George Herbert Walker Bush, the West, uh, and the Russians, uh, with Gorbachev and others, that we would end the Cold War, not fight over the former Eastern Bloc, let it go the way it wanted to self-determine, few with Russia, most with NATO and others, but not move weapons in. And then now that balance is being changed, uh, please continue. Sure. Well, Alex, uh, one of the most important aspects of this, of course, was uh, the quid here for the pro quo. Now, the quo was we wouldn't move NATO eastward. The quid was that the Russians were going to be asked to accept a reunified Germany, okay, <laughs> uh, in NATO, but reunified. Now, I still get hair in the back of my neck bristling when I say that. I lived in Germany for five years. I didn't want to unify Germany, and I'm not a Russian. The Russians suffered 25 million killed during World War II. Uh, that path toward Russia has always been used by Napoleon and other, other people attacking Russia. You can imagine what a bitter pill that was for them to, sw to swallow. And the only reason they swallowed it was for solemn assurances by George H.W. Bush and James Baker, as foreign secretary or as secretary of state, promising that NATO would not move one inch farther toward Russia. Now, what happened? Well, within a few years, there were 12, 12, count them, 12 new NATO members, all to the east of East Germany. Uh, the original membership of NATO was only 12, so it doubled in size. And then, this is key, six years ago, at a NATO summit in Bucharest, Romania, the NATO leaders decided Ukraine would become part of NATO. Not would, will, okay? Now, that was, that was a bridge too far. The coup that was arranged by the U.S. and the EU in Kiev on the 22nd of February, that was one regime change too far. 
The Russians aren't going to permit this, and that's what this is all about, okay? What, what uh, Putin has said is, look, um, we are very concerned about our only warm water port in Sevastopol in Crimea. This is why we, we honored the plebiscite in, in Crimea and accepted Crimea back into uh, Russia proper, the Fe Russian Federation. Uh, because, you know, we, as it's covered, sometimes, uh, sometimes Putin uh, sort of does things in a kind of light manner. He said, now, you know, I'm sure that the NATO and the U.S. sailors are really terrific fellas, okay? But I'd rather not have it to be so that, that our, our sailors are going to have to visit NATO bases in Crimea. I'd much rather have it the way it is now where U.S. NATO sailors are very happy to be entertained by sure, us. Sure, and that's pretty much always been part of Russia. So we've broken down the real history, the mainline history. This is stuff for anybody that even has basic history knowledge would know. Ray McGovern's breaking it down, but if you watch CNN, Fox News, any of it, you would think that the Russians are the most evil people in the world. It's Putin's missile. They want to start World War III. I mean, that whole shoot down of that airplane looked to me like Lusitania Part Two. Ray McGovern, what did you think of that briefly and then finishing up where this is going? Because you got NATO generals saying we need more fighter wings, we need troops. Very provocative. Why would they want to start a new Cold War? Well, you know, Alex, I don't completely understand why anybody would even want to countenance that. You know... You have to look at who profits from these things. Um, Wall Street profits, the weapons manufacturers profit, and they control the media. You know, it's pretty insidious. Uh, I used to read the, the, the Russian media all the time, and, and they had propaganda labels like Wall Street Skirkarabatitsi, which means Wall Street bloodsuckers. Well, I used to think, you know, that's a little ham handed, <laughs> but look what's happened 2008, 2009. Look where we are. So there, there are forces driving this thing that profiteer on conflict. I can't believe that anybody in their, in their right mind would take the danger of taunting sure. Russia to the point where it would retaliate. And when you ask John Kerry that, they asked him a month ago, aren't you aware that this could lead to an armed clash with Russia? And Kerry said, well, yes, I've, I've, taken, I've taken that into account. Well, does he think that his pastel ties and his stentorian voice is going to, going to save him from, from the consequences of this? They look at him as a liar, I'm afraid to say, and as a person that can't be trusted. And Obama, you know, Obama has been not very truthful about these things. So the Russians are on their guard. They don't know exactly what to expect. Nor do I, or why. And that makes this thing very volatile. Well, Ray, that's my final question and also statement to you. I've studied history. It's fascinating. Napoleon was super smart, one of the best generals probably in history, also evil, miscalculated with the Russians. Hitler did the same thing. Uh, but it's larger than that. Even smart dictators can miscalculate, and, 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 and even a smart West that was somewhat moral could miscalculate and have nuclear war back when you were in government, somewhat moral, you know, in general. But this degenerate corporate one where there's so many degrees of separation, they're not even making the decisions based on things. They're just used to making 40 to 1 bets on the stock market with other people's money. It's like Wolf of Wall Street on PCP. They don't even care, and they're clearly making decisions and doing things that are so destabilizing and dangerous that it's not going to be good for their defense contractor business or Wall Street if we have a nuclear war with Russia. I mean, somebody's got to restrain these people because, because it looks like they're asleep at the switch. I mean, I think we've really reached, stick a fork in us, a decadence level in the ruling class where they're off playing golf, Ray. I don't think they even know what they're doing. Now you can watch The Alex Jones Show live as it happens at Infowars.com slash show. You'll find links to all of our content there and a free 15-day trial for Prison Planet TV. More than 60 movies and documentaries all in one place at Infowars.com slash show.
Flexeran, the studies are legion. Sodium fluoride and other toxic members of the fluoride family are devastating the health and cognitive ability of the American people. So why are the social engineers adding it to the water? Simple, dumb down the host population that the parasitic technocracy is feeding on. We may not have been able to get fluoride out of the water supply yet, but we can help to get it out of our bodies. I am extremely excited to announce the exclusive InfoWars Life Fluoride Shield formulation, fusing six of the best documented ingredients from around the world to help the body remove not just toxic fluoride residues from the body, but a whole host of toxic substances. Let's take a stand against the globalist by blocking their poisons with Fluoride Shield. I use Fluoride Shield every day. Secure your Fluoride Shield and other pioneering formulations at InfoWarsLife.com today. Let's start cleansing our bodies now and support the InfoWar at the same time. That's InfoWarsLife.com.